Welcome to episode 494 of Salcedo Paranormal. And tonight I am continuing my review of the complete books of Charles Fort. As always, you can find all episodes of the show along with links to social media and other ways to contact me at the podcast page. And that is salcedoparanormal.podbean.com. That's S A L S I D O paranormal.podbean.com. Always happy to hear from you all, whether you have comments or questions or topic suggestions or stories of paranormal experiences, whether they're your own or from others that you trust. Happy to either read those or have you join me on the show to talk about them. Thank you all for listening. Whether you are here for the live streams on Discord or if you listen to the podcast or YouTube feeds or if you listen on the Trouble Minds Radio Network, KUAP Digital Broadcasting. There you can hear replays of two episodes of the show every night at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern, right before Trouble Minds Radio comes on. As always, I want to thank Michael Strange, host of Trouble Minds Radio, as well as Liam Martin, host of the Exile Minds podcast, for producing the shows and putting them up on the station as you hear them with all the music and everything. If you'd like to support the show, there are some different ways to do that. You can always share the show with others and rate and review it on your podcast platform of choice. Uh, I've heard that the uh, rating and reviewing really does help, so um, that would be amazing if you all could do that. Uh, also, I have uh, some par- paranormal fiction and nonfiction books on Amazon you can check out as well. And I have a Patreon page where... Um, I put out content whenever I can. I have one uh, show up there so far and uh, more to come. And there you can join any of the membership level uh, tier levels there, and any of them will get you all the extra content. Also, if you'd just like to make a one-time donation through uh, or for the show, you can do that through PayPal or Venmo. And uh, help is never expected, but always appreciate it, as there are expenses in making these shows from equipment to research materials to travel expenses. I will be going to the Mid-Michigan Paracon this year, uh, November 4th and 5th, so it's basically right after Halloween, Saturday and Sunday after Halloween this year. And um, I'll be going there, and uh, I'll be going to the Soaring Eagle Eagle Casino and Resort in Mount Pleasant, Michigan. Again, that's November 4th and 5th. And uh, to make um, to check out the, all the presentations that I can, and also to make audio recordings of myself and anyone else that wants to join me, uh, talking about all things paranormal, and then I'll bring those back and play those on future shows. So looking forward to that as well. And uh, that's only a few weeks away now, basically. So uh, I think that covers everything. Uh, thank you all again for um, all your support so far with the show and everything. Uh, looking to have uh, a couple of either one or two shows coming up within the next couple of weeks here uh, with uh, good friends of the show. And uh, I will keep you all posted on that as it gets closer. And uh, we get also closer to episode 500. So really looking forward to that show as well. And I think that covers everything. So let me get back to this review um, of the complete books of Charles Fort. As I always say, I use a, uh, an AI, basically a chatbot, to summarize everything. And then I, re- I read the summary, and then I just uh, sort of comment on it as I go. We are nearing the end of the second of the four books. Uh, six more sections to go of that, I believe. And uh, so we'll see how far we get through with that tonight. If we don't finish that, uh, that second book tonight, then we'll definitely uh, be finishing it next for the next one of these shows and uh, get on to book three. So uh, this is uh, chapter 33 in part two of new lands. <laughs> Excuse me. So uh, this, this chapter describes uh, an extraordinary geological formation in Arizona called Coon Butte or Crater Mountain, this large, deep cavity was likely formed long ago when something violently gouged 
the landscape. It says that different types of meteorites, including iron masses, iron shale, and rounded uh, spheres of shale, have been found uh, in and around this uh, crater. And this, uh, this all according to four, of course, this uh, suggests multiple fall, falls occurred in different times. That's amazing. Hundreds of iron meteorites were found on the surface near the crater, while some shale meteorites were uh, buried deeper, which shows that they fell earlier. And uh, the crater is estimated to be about 700 years old, based on the age of the cedar trees on the rim. Now, keep in mind, this book was written about 100 years ago, right on there. Uh, Fort speculates there may have been a powerful blast between Earth and another land that caused the uh, this crater. Other meteorite finds in Arizona are mentioned in the book, including large iron masses found miles from the main crater. And um, it says here that an exceptional fall of over 14,000 stones occurred at Holbrook in 1912. And so this, uh, th that's basically what this chapter was about here, describing uh, an, an intriguing crater formation in Arizona. That's, um, that's I'm when you think of all the, the uh, people that have reported just all kinds of paranormal activity there in, the, in that state in general over the many, many years here. And so I wonder if that has something to do with it. Uh, all this uh, sort of all the these minerals and that could then have energy in them or and and around them that could then be put into the ground, maybe charging that as well. I don't know for sure, but I wonder about that with um uh, with with the possibility there of energy from outside of Earth sort of being stored in these objects that then collide with Earth. So. Just a thought there, but um, so that's that chapter. Move on to the next one here, uh, chapter 34. And uh, this section talks about uh, mysterious lights, sounds, and apparent aerial vehicles seen in the skies in the early 1900s, uh, particularly around the times of oppositions of Mars, when Mars is closest to Earth, apparently. Uh, Charles Fort suggests these sightings indicate Earth is stationary. Of course, now, I don't think that's so much the case anymore. Uh, but while other planets move around it, rather than the Earth. So this is sort of before, I guess, um, more science was established that showed everything moving. But uh, Fort documents sightings of aerial lights and objects with searchlights in New England and elsewhere in late 1909, around the time of a close approach of Venus to Earth. <clears throat> okay, so um, so again, that's a lot of light. If it's like a searchlight, that's a lot of light um, that he's talking about there. Uh, Fort argues that these sightings could not be explained by known human airship or airplane technology at the time, so may indicate extraterrestrial craft. And uh, Fort also documents uh, detonations and explosive sounds heard over Re Reading, or Reading in England in November of 1912 suggesting they were unexplained sky phenomena rather than earthquakes. Uh, so overall, Fort is um, basically shows or lists all these things as evidence against the conventional uh, astronomy of the time and suggests mysterious and potentially, potentially extraterrestrial explanations. So... Um, Moving on to the next chapter here, and I, I 
some of that does make sense in a way, possibly being things from outside of Earth. Um, but uh, again, with this book, you always have to keep in mind it was these books were written almost 100 years ago, over 100 years ago. So some uh, things may have since been uh, figured out more so than they, they were at the time. So, but um, moving on to the next chapter here. This one is chapter 35. And this uh, chapter talks about, um, let's see here, mysterious lights and uh, objects in the skies over the UK and Canada in 1913. The sightings took place between January and April of that year, with clusters of sightings reported in different locations in England and Wales on various states that's over in the UK. Uh, the objects were variously described as lights, airships, and fast-moving objects. There was a gap in sightings in the UK between February 5th and 20, uh, the 21st. During this time, on February 9th, a remarkable procession of lights was seen in the skies over Toronto, Canada. Uh, taking place over the course of about three to five minutes. And uh, this was seen from Saskatchewan to Bermuda, according to one report. Uh, the sightings sparked a lot of speculation and uh, theories at the time, including suggest suggestions. They were, of course, secret uh, airships from other countries. Uh, astronomical astronomical phenomena like Venus or meteors, or unknown anomalous objects, and the explanations were contested and debated. So uh, Charles Fort, of course, collected a lot of these, documented a lot of these reports, and uh, he. Um, so that's why he's sharing these uh, reports of these sightings in this chapter there. And that's the end of that chapter as well. So um, this is getting to the end of the second book here. So, uh, And again, this chapter 36 talks about many uh, strange and un unexplained events that uh, Fort collected evidence of, including mysterious objects and lights seen in the skies, more explosions, and tremors felt on Earth and on materials falling from the sky. So basically more of the same here. Uh, Fort sees these as, as hints of undiscovered lands and realms beyond our ordinary experience and current scientific understanding. So, um, so let's see here. Scrolling down, because there's a lot of this that's basically... Yeah, so that's basically the end of that chapter. And... Uh, so moving on to chapter 37 here. Uh, Fort suggests the geo system is, is compared to an incubating organism with the Earth as its nucleus. And it is influenced by external forces like meteors and electricity. There's an idea from the constellations. Uh, the concept of uh, evolution, of course, this is all according to Fort is rejected in, in favor of super embryonic development. That's an, quite the phrase. An idea that development occurs according to a predetermined schedule or design, not just ad adaptation to the environment. Uh, so parts are held back or suppressed until their scheduled time. And I guess this is all about just the weird things that have been happening all around the earth and, and why they've been happening. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, this is getting into stuff. I think I'm a little bit out of my league to try to summarize here. So we're going to leave the rest of that chapter, but that's basically seems to be what it's talking about. Um, leaving or going to the last chapter of this book here. Uh, this describes various events such as uh, explosions in the sky and rocks falling from the clouds, 
and uh, unknown insects and spider webs falling from the sky. Uh, Fort sees these as evidence that there are new lands, going back to the title of the book, in the sky, uh, stationary relative to the Earth. And uh, Fort mentions several thing, uh, several events that happened in Chile. I think that's how you say that country's name, where earthquakes were accompanied by strange illuminations in the sky, or even flaming skies. Uh, the author uh, Fort sees a connection between these events and uh, seismic seismic activity in the area, and things falling from the sky. So let's see here, Fort. Uh, Goes back into, of course, criticizing mainstream science because that's what Fort does. Uh, and so basically, the uh, Fort again points out the possibility of there being these other lands, these new lands, as being evidence for all these different things that have come down from the sky and move, move through the sky and everything. So that's, uh, that's the, basically the end of that book. So it really was interesting. It, um, Sorry, I had to skip some sections there, but when it gets too deep into sort of uh, scientific theory and and uh, other things like that, I kind of it pretty much loses me. So, but um, so that was really an amazing book there, and uh, just all the different reports of all these different things. Now the next one is called Lo L O exclamation mark, and I did a little bit of reading. I read a little bit of a summary of the book beforehand. Uh, from the, the site that I looked at about the book, and it appears to be appears to focus a lot on the idea of teleportation, uh, which of course is um, something that uh, mainstream science, I believe, last I heard anyway, is does not think is easily achievable at this point. But um, it's something that happens in so much of the paranormal or the, or the unexplained where things just appear or disappear out of nowhere. And um, and then sometimes they reappear and sometimes they don't. And that goes ranges from objects and houses and buildings to creatures, um, cryptids of different kinds, obviously to ghosts appearing and vanishing. Of course, we don't know how that's working. Uh, I think a lot of that, too, is is it really teleporting or is it just fading in and out of view? But it's hard to know because we don't know how any of that works. Uh, but it also would range, I would think, to uh, different uh, things that have been seen in the sky that just appear to basically appear there suddenly and then and or vanish suddenly without moving. So, uh, but anyway, I think I can get through at least a couple of sections of this fr first part of this third book here in this uh, this collection here. So this um, this is part one, chapter one. Uh, this uh, first chapter discusses strange things that happen, like showers of living creatures, uh, such as frogs, snails, worms, other things like that, falling from the sky. And um, apparently, as of the book, as of when this book was made, uh, four had collected. Let's see here, two hundred and ninety-four records of such showers of living things. So he mentions the conventional explanations such as whirlwinds and other things like that. And but then he mentions also of course and before that a lot of these things that fall they fall in very small areas. <clears throat> so which seems to make those ideas of just being wind less likely at least uh according to him in some cases anyway. So Fort cites examples of these strange events, uh, like a shower of just frogs terrifying horses in Nevada. Uh, I don't even know what this animal is. Spring box? Spring B-O-K-S. Irritated by falling frogs in, maybe it's because it's in South Af Africa. That might be why. I don't know what that is. Uh, and red worms falling with snowflakes in Sweden. So uh, Fort questions how to determine the uh, validity of these reports and whether the creatures are uh, actually fell from the sky or were uh, imagined 
or lied about. Of course, when you have, if you have multiple people having an experience, I always sort of lean to the side, the, lean away from the idea that they're just lying. But um, I mean, unless it's actually proven to be the case. Uh, so let's see here. Fort argues there seems to be an underlying uh, oneness or intelligent selectivity behind these events, transporting or distributing living creatures in this uh, mysterious way. And I would agree there. It is odd. How is how that decided or determined or even accomplished? So uh, moving on here, still in this first chapter, uh, Fort shows how uh, conventional explanations are forced onto these bizarre events to make uh, them seem ordinary. So, um, let's see here. So, yeah, that's basically that chapter. And uh, moving on to the next one here, uh, chapter two, which might be where we end it today. We'll see. So, Charles Fort in this chapter discusses the events of showers of living creatures like frogs and fish uh, in this chapter. He argues for uh, underlying uh, oneness again. It goes back to that one thing again. Uh, Fort, let's see here. So this is um, interesting here. Fort rejects metaphysical speculations wanting to uh, conceive of Existence as a whole, the way cells in an organism may comprehend the uh, comprehend the larger organism they are part of. I have no idea what that exactly means, but okay. Uh, Fort proposes proposes thinking of existence as an organism, calling it different um, names that people have used to talk about basically all of existence. Um, and uh, this organism itself seems to be uh, selecting and distributing uh, things like oxygen and materials. So uh, Fort uh, so, uh, basically from here on out starts to focus on data from around, or uh, basically from, I can't talk, talk uh, coming up with this idea of this transportary force as in teleportation, which uh, seems to intelligently distribute living creatures in this unexplained way. And uh, let's see here. So, of course, Fort expects to be accused of collecting lies and superstition, but others, uh, I'm sorry, offers the data for uh, consideration, neither fully believing nor disbelieving the accounts. I sort of like that about him as well. And uh, so, yeah, basically that's what that chapter is about. Um, it says that Fort wants to shift away from conventional explanations and view existence as an intelligent organism. So that's basically his, what he's focusing on, I guess, in this book. And um, it is neat to see sort of his ideas change over time uh, throughout these books. So um, I think that's where we're going to end with the summaries here today. Uh, got about a minute left or so, maybe a little bit less. But looking forward to continuing this review of these books. It's been a lot of, uh, it's been challenging at times, but it's been a lot of fun. And uh, so, and I mean, the last book is called Wild Talents, which I'm really excited to get to that because that uh, suggests some other things as well. But thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you all on the next episode of Salcedo Paranormal. Take care.